，哎，请坐。Hi, Aaron. Glad to see you in person finally. <laughs> Good to see you. How are you doing? I'm not sure if I'm name right. Oh, it's Gittler. Gittler, right? Okay, thank you. Do you want to test out your slides? All right. Uh, let's see. Can I share the screen now? Yeah, you're, for me, it seems like your connection is a little bit bad. Yeah, I don't know what's uh, going on. I'm going to stay on campus. She puts me, she has better Wi-Fi signal. And then it needs to be stable. There's something today, yeah. Oh, it's another meeting, a little bit shaky today. I don't know what's, what's going on. Do you have another uh, internet you can use? Uh, let me see. Unfortunately, my uh, wire is I have not using wired uh, internet for a while. Let me see anything else to be better. Um, let me see. Maybe I can maybe. put on an, another. Or use your wire, your cell phone data uh using cell phone i, I don't know it just, cell phone probably the worse. Quality is okay cell phone probably worse because if you, a cell phone has to rely mostly on the wi-fi um the cellular data is not uh on this on the box that i know cellular data is not not very good here okay um, right, right now it's very hard to hear you you cannot even hear me I All can, right. but it's it's not very stable. Okay. Uh, let me switch to um to the uh, uh I'm mean, switch to a different Wi-Fi mode. See what that helps. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe, all right. Sorry. Let's, let me try that. Okay. We'll let uh, GMN try. Hi, GMN. All right. Hi. Uh, let me stop my Hi, sharing. Uh, can Hi. you? Good, good to see you. Good to see you too. Can you guys uh, hear my voice clearly? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah, I may try my point point for one more time. Is it okay, Aaron? Yeah, yes, please. Okay. Yes. Seems as good as yesterday. Um, I don't see it yet. Oh, okay. You don't see my point point? Oh, now, now I do, now I do. It's good. Okay. Now I'm showing the first slide, so you. Yeah, okay. Was the um was Ching Zhong's uh, audio uh, choppy for you too? Ching Zhong's audio. Yes. Was the, yes. Yeah. Yes. It, okay. Because it wasn't me. Mm, not only you. I also hear the the voice sounds like choppy. Okay. Mm. Okay. Shall I stop sharing? Sure. Does everything look look good to you? Yes. Uh, to me, it's uh, really good. Okay. Great. Yeah. Good. Let me uh, stop sharing here. Okay. How about your uh, recruiting at Westlake? How's it going? Uh, now the coming in CV seems uh, uh, less than before, probably due to the season. It's not for job marketing season. Oh, maybe you could tell people here. <laughs> okay. 
that that would be great. But not many neuroscientists apply precision so far. Oh, okay. I'm trying to find them for you. <laughs> Hi, hello. Hi. Hey, it's long. See you. Hi. We'll see you. Where's my virtual background? We like seeing your laundry behind you. <laughs> That's good. Like it's an open closet. I, I saw you there's a symposium at West Lake about the Alzheimer's. Yeah. Thing, yeah? Yes. Yes. It's, it has amazing auditorium. It's inviting <laughs> uh, it's, uh, physicians. Um, Yes. Yes. Yeah. Where did you see those information from? Uh, WeChat? From Li Ming, from Li Ming's WeChat. It's, oh. it's like a yeah. co-host uh, the symposium. Yeah, Li Ming is invited. Oh, you you are the first uh, Westlake speaker for Neurozone, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Hope they have um, more. Yeah. It, uh, definitely, there's a better scientist uh, uh, coming more. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think uh, Lin Juanhe, she's also working on neuroscience, special. Okay. At uh, neuroimmunology. Okay. Wow. Yeah. She's a good. Yeah. I, I remember her name yeah. somewhere. She's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. and Sun Yi is working in social behavior with uh, Dragon uh, Drosophila. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, Gao Liang is working on the um, brain clearance uh, by developing a new. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, it's a lot. You got a neuroscience community in the Westlake. Okay. <laughs> and so far, compared to other. Subject, uh -huh. Neuroscience, uh -huh. still not Is another speaker here yet? He was, but uh, have we tried a slide yet? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, you did. I, I did. Okay, very good, great. Oh, Xiao Chen told me he's coming to Bay Area. Yeah. So, do this. You should come too. It's long. It's fun here. As come to us, it's fine, but it's probably it's how to come back. We Lost just no, it's short, shorter, right? You had a uh, seven days and even shorter, maybe you know three days, five days quarantine, and it's fine. Yeah, that's what I heard. Hopefully they'll shorten it. Mm -hmm. uh, Lou Bai was here. I had dinner with him the other night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw news and he's having lunch and dinner with all everybody. Very happy with between this lunch. Yeah.
Are you still doing that cell press seminar, Jimin? Cell press seminar, yes. I think it's approaching to uh, finish and we are gonna start another series with science. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, and now the Wang Xi, she is mainly responsible PI. Uh, she is uh, uh, asking for the volunteers to, uh, to host those next series. Yeah, you did a really great job with those other ones. The talks were really good. Thank you. I did uh, prepare a lot for that. So <laughs> long. <laughs> when you have time, mm -hmm. welcome visit our campus. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I definitely, it's definitely true. I missed a few chances before. I definitely would not miss chance next time. Okay, that would uh, be yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never been there yet. It's so sad. Yes. I've never been to the Lake yet. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I, I should be more active. Uh, you know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I remember next time I will send you your email. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, so close. Yeah. Are you going to the new campus or staying in the old campus? Uh, actually, I already moved to new campus with my oh, families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but my lab cool. is still in the old campus, but we'll be moving soon in this summer. Is that far? So new campus from old campus? Uh, maybe uh, one hour driving. Oh, oh, come back awesome. online. Okay, okay, okay. Mm. Oh, it's pretty far. Okay. Yeah. It must be splendid. So, um, new uh, campus, right? Uh, it's can you hear so me? far. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Great, you change on, thanks. Okay, I, I was not able to fix uh, the internet, but I still had to use the Wi-Fi I have, but hopefully it'll be good enough. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> made it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, DeLong, should we sure, get sure. started? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another NeuroZoom week. Great to see everyone. Um, next week, um, we have a break. Uh, no talks next week, July 4th, holiday in America, Independence Day. So um, these are like party toothpicks. I, got, I had a party in Shanghai, and um, I just put them on the cheese and olives. But anyway, no talks next week, um, but then we'll get right back at it on the 11th and the 12th. So um, thanks for coming today and next week we have off and then we'll be back at it the following week. Okay, so um, DeLong is up to introduce the uh, first speaker. Okay, uh, thanks Sarah. So uh, it's my good pleasure to introduce the uh, Professor Jimin, uh, Jimin Jia, who is uh, one of the last uh, for now, this is an Iowa nominee series. Uh, since of, we have, we have uh, how many? Four or five already, right? So Jimin also is from uh, a beautiful campus. It's a young, one of the youngest. I remember for, people call USSD the best of youngest. Uh, I, I'm sure West, West Lake is the uh, youngest of the best. Right? Uh, so um, it's a West Lake University, who is the, in nearby uh, Shanghai, it's Hangzhou. A beautiful city. I think uh, any of you who should be should visit there. It's a beautiful new campus, and has a gathering a, a lot of uh, new young talent people. So Jimmy has uh, get her uh, bachelor degree from uh, Zhejiang Normal University. After that, she has a PhD program in uh, Iowan, uh, working with Professor Zhu uh, Qixiong. Uh, uh, after PhD, he went to US. I did a first postdoc with the NIH and with Xiong Li. After that, she went to uh, UC Southwestern, uh, working with actually another uh, Iowan alumni, uh, Wu Ping Ge, where he started, she started to work with the, uh, for the uh, aspect of the, after ischemia stroke, how the uh, blood uh, vessel uh, astrocyte interaction to contribute this uh, recovery. So she come back to uh, West Lake University to start her own lab. So uh, in his, her own lab, uh, her uh, Jamie has started an interesting program to talk about the interesting uh, role of a spontaneous uh, vascular role to prevent to pro promote the blood re 
perfusion in the blood, uh, in the brain recovery after ischemia stroke. Okay, so uh, that, so welcome, Jimmy. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Zilong. I'm gonna share my slide. Sure, can the slide show. All right, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great honor to receive invitation from NeuroZoom and uh, thanks Zilong for your kind introduction. Uh, my talk uh, will be discussing a new strategy for promoting brain recovery after ischemic stroke. You may know that uh, in every 40 seconds, one stroke occur, and in every four minutes, one dies of a stroke, which makes it the second leading cause of death uh, worldwide. And it is uh, sadly the number one cause of death in uh, China. Um, besides, stroke is also the one of the leading cause of adult disability. Um, unfortunately, more than uh, half a century's research, there is still no cure for it. Thus, it uh, needs a continuous uh, basic research. Um, stroke can be caused either by clot or by bleeding in the uh, brain. The clot can be locally generated uh, thrombies or by the emboli that arise outside of the brain and they travel through the artery system until they become clogged uh, in a smaller arterial. The ischemic stroke um, brain uh, tissue gets uh, infarcted uh, under the ischemic stroke, which is the most common type of stroke and also is a major interest of our lab. While the homo uh, hemorrhagic stroke uh, is less common, the only approved treatment of stroke uh, in, uh, treatments includes uh, uh, surgery, which is to remove the thrombus mechanically or by the, using the drug called a tissue plasminogen activator to dissolve the thrombus or embolus. Uh, both of these treatments need to be provided within a very short time window of four to six hours. Thus, if you notice someone suddenly have a face drop or weakness of arm or difficulty in speech, please call 112 uh, immediately in China because time manners are a lot. But unfortunately, both of the treatment only can be provided to less than 10% of patient. So there is an extensive study has been focusing on protect neuron. More than 1,000 neuron protective agents has been uh, going on in uh, clinical trials, but disappointedly, uh, none of them succeed. So the field started thinking about maybe focusing only in neurons, uh, repair neurons is not enough. Vascular repair is equally important. Middle cerebral artery is the most frequently occluded artery in the patients. And uh, like I said before, clinicians are very good at restoring those blood in the big arteries in the up upstream. However, it is far from uh, satisfying that the blood flow in the downstream of the small arterials or capillaries are still severely compromised. That means that successful recanalization doesn't mean successful reperfusion. Thus, our lab's goal is to restore the blood flow in the downstream uh, arterial and, uh, and uh, capillary. In humans, uh, in human patients or experimental animals, Small, down, uh, small arterials uh, is often found uh, to be constricted and uh, stiff. And we know that the more active uh, vessels have more powerful in um, blood transportation than the inert vessel, which is uh, uh, more stiff. So my lab uh, is uh, aimed to denilate the Funct uh, cellular and molecular mechanism underlying those functional deficit of vascular mo motor activity. Uh, we know that uh, uh, there is a phenomenon is called a spontaneous vessel motion, which refers to the ultra slow 
and the sinusoidal uh, fluctuation of the vascular diameter. This phenomena, uh, spontaneous vessel motion, has been dis uh, was discovered 150 years ago, and it, later it was found ubiquitously exist in uh, different species, including human, mouse, rat, and a cat. And also, the spontaneous vessel motion occurred in many uh, vascular beds, including uh, peripheral organs and central nervous system. Spontaneous vessel motion is thought to occur relatively independent of heartbeat pulsation, which oscillated at one hertz, and also independent from respiratory cycles around 0.5 hertz. While the smooth muscle cell um, driven the uh, contractility oscillated around the uh, 0.1 hertz is a, a major driver of the spontaneous vessel motion. And it's also called ultra slow vascular oscillation centered at 0.1 hertz. We are very curious about how, um, how are those smooth muscle cell driven the spontaneous vessel motion play a role in the um, for the effective reperfusion and further for brain recovery after a successful uh, recanalization. This question comes along with two smaller questions. First, we still don't know whether ischemic stroke can cause long lasting vessel motion deficits beyond the occlusive period. And the second is how are we gonna to manipulate arterial vessel motion? In order to address those questions, my lab has been uh, trying to uh, establish the combination, com combination of different technologies, such as use two photon microscopy to live image in the vascular, uh, vascular motion in the live brain, combined with a traditional stroke model called a middle cerebral artery occlusion, which is achieved by inserting a suture through the common carotid artery until the beginning part of the middle cerebral artery and cause the brain infunction. With the wealthy world of genetic transgenic mice, and we are lucky to uh, find a smooth muscle cell specific driven CRE, which you can manipulate the gene expression and uh, down regulation specifically in smooth muscle cell. With this technology, um, we are beginning to examine what is, uh, how is the spontaneous vessel motion in the live mouse brain. You may notice that there is a very uh, small um, arterial um, diameter fluctuation in the left bottom corner. And compared to those, uh, the vascular wall of the venue, which seems like very stable. And if we do the keep line scanning of one part, one side of the vascular wall, and the chemograph will give us a very obvious the vessel motion trace of those PR arterials and uh, penetrating arterials. However, the vessel wall of the venue seems very quiet. And we develop our own algorithm to quantify those oscillations and found that it is there's a uh, frequency, ultra low frequency of both PR arterial and the penetrating arterials around 1.1 Hertz. And then those frequency in the venue is quite low. And the amplitude of those oscillations is quite small. And our quantification is consistent with people's finds in the other uh, publications. Usually is around 2% uh, um, of the amplitude of those oscillations and maximally can reach like a 5%. And in our analysis, we were able to differentiate the amplitude of the penetrating arterial oscillation uh, from the PR arterial oscillation, which demonstrate our quantification is reliable. With this technology and analysis uh, um, in hand, we are continuing to examine what happened to the vascular motion after stroke attack. You can clearly see that the same vessel, the same smooth muscle cells, vessel motor significantly changed 
at one day after recanalization following two hours of occlusion, you can see the vesicular wall become more stiff and quiescent than the uh, previous uh, healthy smooth muscle cell. And then you can see the uh, amplitude of the um, fluctuation of the smooth muscle cell showing in blue is much smaller than the healthy smooth muscle cell showing in green. And also the quantification shows that there are slightly decrease of vessel motion frequency as well as the amplitude. And this results demonstrate that indeed the stroke can impair the spontaneous vessel motion because vessel motion is intimately uh, correlated with the flow motion, both in the small arterials and the capillary. And we uh, infer that those deficit in small uh, vessel motion in the upper stream or small arterials will functionally affect those flow, uh, blood flow in the downstream capillary. Maybe this is one of the major contribution of the um, blood flow compromisation even um, despite the uh, successful recanalization at the beginning, uh, big part of the arterial. Now we are gonna to think about how, if this is only correlation study, how are we gonna to manipulate those arterial um, uh, oscillations? Um, unfortunately, in this field, the mechanistic study uh, is still incomplete, and most of the mechanism was discovered in the peripheral organs, such as mes mesenteric arterial in the gut. People have found that neurogenic regulation and endothelial dependent regulation do have some contribution to the spontaneous vessel motion. However, the smooth muscle cell, contractile smooth muscle cell, plays a central role in regulating the uh, in execute, execute this spontaneous um, vessel motion. There are three uh, postulated mechanism is uh, be, uh, has been to explain those. Uh, uh, oscillatory, oscillatory behavior of smooth muscle cell. One of them is uh, based on the uh, membrane potential. Although smooth muscle cell doesn't fire action potential, but they do have a fluctuation of membrane potential, which uh, in the mesenteric arterial, people have found that a calcium dependent chloride channel is a driving force or initiate initiation of those potential oscillation. And a second pathway was postulated, uh, postulated by the uh, G protein coupled receptor dependent PLC uh, activity, which leads to the IP3 production and work on the IP3 receptor, which induces the um, endogenous calcium oscillations, IP3 receptor dependent. And people think IP3 receptor is the pacemaker uh, in the calcium oscillation inside of the smooth muscle cell. The third um, pathway has been postulated as a temporal control of cal global calcium dependent uh, cross bridge cycling. So in all of those pathways seems very relevant with the contractile activity of smooth muscle cell based on the tool limitation, because there is a no like an imaging sensor for smooth muscle cell uh, to show the membrane potential oscillation in vivo. So far, we uh, focus on our attention to the calcium oscillation. Thus, we um, examine the, the calcium oscillation in uh, the smooth muscle cell in cross all of the phases of the stroke, including before ischemia, during ischemia, and after the successful recanalization. You can notice that the uh, calcium oscillation in the smooth muscle cell constantly fluctuated. Well, you can uh, see that during the occlusion, there is just during the con uh, ischemia stroke can reliably and uh, uh, repeatedly induce uh, uh, spread, spreading depolarization, which will be followed by a, a um, arterial constriction. Concomitantly, there is a tsunami of uh, calcium elevation, global calcium elevation in the smooth muscle cell. And then this, uh, um, after those tsunami, there is a, a uh, dysregulation or 
in irregular calcium fluctuation in the smooth muscle cell. Most importantly, in one day uh, following recanalization, the global signaling in the smooth muscle cell was totally gone. And the chemograph can show you that those the calcium elevation is tightly correlated with the vascular uh, cap caliber. And uh, in, you can tell that the blood flow inside the arterial is much slower than the before and uh, uh, also correlated with the uh, diminishing uh, calcium, global calcium levels in the uh, smooth muscle cell. Um, because smooth muscle cell, people already know that uh, the calcium oscillation is uh, uh, tightly um, correlated with the calcium shuttling between the mitochondria and the ER underlies the cytoplasmic calcium oscillation. And we wonder under such a high level of calcium concentration, what happened to the mitochondrial morphology and the mitochondrial deficit in the smooth muscle cell? We, um, we examined the, the mitochondrial behavior in during occlusion, we found that Immediately following those arterial constriction, mitochondria undergoes fission immediately. And even at one day after the recanalization, we can still see the mitochondria remain to be fissioned. And those broken mitochondria might be involved in uh, dysregulated uh, calcium oscillation. And recently, people have discovered that the uh, calcium shuttling through mitochondrial ER contact is critical for calcium oscillation. And uh, uh, we adopt uh, this concept and examine whether mitochondrial ER contact will be damaged in after ischemia stroke. Indeed, we found the contact area per a mitochondria was remain declined at one day after recanalization. Because in the field, people already have developed a, a molecular tool, which is called a MRFP, flanked by the two signaling um, peptide. One is targeting to the outer membrane of mitochondria, and the other part is targeting to the ER. Uh, the sequence is from the YUBC6. And this peptide has been uh, demonstrated uh, uh, successfully forced the anchoring of mitochondria to ER at the EM level. And uh, people already use this uh, plasmid, overexpress this plasmid in the endophyte uh, of astrocyte and found that it's beneficial for um, vascular new uh, uh, angiogenesis after brain injury. We, use this molecule, mo molecule tool and uh, to develop a report mice which overexpress the mitral linker together with GCAMP6 to see whether we, uh, we can uh, rescue those uh, calcium oscillation and uh, spontaneous vessel motion after force the anchoring the mitochondria to ER. And as you can uh, see that uh, I showed before there's a global reduction of the global uh, calcium level in the smooth muscle cell. And when we forced the mitochondrial ER contact and found that those um, uh, ER contact can prevent the reduction of the uh, global uh, calcium level, as you can quantification showing here that this after it overexpresses the ME linker, the reduction of the calcium level in the smooth muscle cell can be rescued. And we can't wait to, to examine the vessel motion. And uh, on top of that, we, uh, we were able to rescue the calcium uh, level in the smooth muscle cell. We examined the, the um, fluctuation of vascular wall in the arterial and uh, found that uh, uh, there is a remaining uh, a remaining oscillation in the arterial wall in both the PR arterial and the penetrating arterial, and I found that both the frequency and the amplitude can be uh, maintained after overexpressing the metal ER linker. Uh, one interesting phenomenon is usually after stroke, the 
arterial will uh, undergo uh, abnormal constriction. However, in the ME linker mouse, we find the opposite phenomena that the arterial even become uh, diameter of the arterial even become larger um, after rescue the spontaneous um, vessel motion, which implicated that uh, uh, spontaneous vessel motion not only might not only be able to promote a flow motion, but also have an impact of the absolute diameter of the arterials. And we uh, want to check whether those vessel motion, uh, rescued vessel motion can promote the true blood reperfusion in the downstream of a small arterial and the capillaries. By using laser speckle contrast imaging, we found that uh, even um, many days after successful recanalization, the blood flow in the ischemia area remain hypofused. However, if we overexpress ME linker only in a smooth muscle cell, which only account uh, less than 1.0% of total cell population in the brain can fully rescue the blood flow in the ischemia area. And we next to examine whether that's uh, whether those uh, a rescue of blood circulation can really protect the neuron from degeneration and uh, brain atrophy. We used uh, um, flow JDC, which can detect the uh, degenerating neurons in the brain. As you can see here, uh, two days after recanalization, the, the first uh, ME, uh, first uh, metal ER contact, uh, enhanced metal ER contact can um, attenuate those um, neural degeneration. And at it for 15 days after recanalization, we found that the uh, ME linker mouse can attenuate those brain uh, atrophy in compared to the control mice. And here quantification data shows those infected area is reduced in the mouse brain. Uh, for each mouse, we check the 30 brain uh, slices uh, in, in order to uh, exclude those uh, any bias. And the body weight, usually after stroke attack, body weight will go uh, sharply uh, decreased and then re recover uh, back to uh, close to normal uh, body weight uh, around uh, seven days after the ischemia. And uh, in, interestingly, in our ME link mice, we found that there's an initial drop of the body weight is uh, more severe than the control mice, but later on, once past the uh, day five after Macau and the body weight recovery, although it's not significant from well type, but it do show the ten tendency of uh, recovery of body weight. So thus, I would like to summarize that um, ischemic stroke indeed can impair the arterial vessel motion, maybe through the following mechanisms by uh, reducing the global calcium level and the mitochondrial uh, fission, uh, promote mitochondrial fission and damage and reduce the mitochondrial ER contact. And uh, our manipulation of uh, those uh, vasculation is through the forced um, metal ER contact, uh, specifically in smooth muscle cell. We found that it can prevent the global reduction of calcium level and the maintenance the arterial uh, vessel smooth uh, arterial vessel motion and the following blood reperfusion and the neuron degeneration. To take home message, uh, we wanted to express that. Uh, Facilitating smooth muscle cell driven vessel motion may serve as a new therapeutic targeting process for stroke treatment. Because recently, um, not only vessel motion can promote the flow motion inside the blood vessel, um, but also recently work have been showing that uh, arterial vessel motion is tightly correlated with perivascular clearance uh, and also uh, the, those vessel motions will promote the uh, reabsorption of the tissue um, liquid uh, back to the blood vessel, which implies vessel motion also have a very important role in the preventing the oedema or expansion of the oedema. Thus, uh, we think the arterial vessel motion is very important in the um, uh, 
pathophysiological uh, process of stroke. Um, okay, with that, I would like to thank for your attention and thank the fundings from our university and uh, uh, NS, uh, National, uh, National Natural Science Foundation of China and also the funding from Zhejiang province. And especially thank our collaborators like uh, uh, Zhou Bo in Shanghai SIPS provided the smooth muscle cell specific Korea ER mouse and also the other peoples in different uh, affiliates. And especially thank the Jingzhe who acquired all of all of the two photon imaging data, uh, who's a postdoc in my lab, and Yi Yi Zhang, who is a first graduate student in my lab. Uh, he did uh, all of those uh, data analysis work. At the last, I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, James. Uh, congratulations, that's very interesting discovery. The open for this discussion. So um, I have the first quick question. So what is the molecular mechanism underlying the mitochondrial contact to ER? Is there some specific receptors? Do we know? Yes, the MFN2, which is a report, which was pre previously reported to make a mitochondrial fusion, right? And later was found okay. that MFN2 was used to anchor in the mitochondrial to the ER. And we also okay. have already uh, knocked out those MFN2 to see whether it had effect on the vessel motion as well. So some Course is when they supposed to contact or when they're supposed to dissociate. Is there regulated by some physiological activity or pathological activity? Right? So I, I, I have no idea well, when the mitochondria have to contact with ER. Do we, do we know what is the mechanism regulating the contact? What where they have to I, I don't know, so, so it's an open question. Oh, yeah, this is a really great question. I need to think about it because usually when we study mitochondrial ER is used by EM, we are not able to uh, examine the dynamic process. Uh, probably we need uh, like a single molecule imaging to in the live cells <laughs> to see those uh, dynamic okay. contacts. Yeah. Is there uh, questions from audience? Yeah, if I may ask a question, beautiful talk, uh, very hard to match. Uh, the, the, the question is, um, do you, did you see any problem with the mice where you kind of permanently attach the uh, mitochondria to the ER? Uh, so far, the mouse looks uh, good, but uh, during the acute ischemia period, we do find a adverse effect. You know, it drives more frequent uh, drastic, uh, drastic vessel constriction double times. But however, in during the uh, recanalization period, it seems it works beneficially. So it depends which period of ischemic stroke. But uh, uh, because those uh, uh, Cree line also expressed in the peripheral arterioles, we haven't uh, uh, got time to examine the detailed physiology function of the whole body yet. But uh, thank you for your reminder. Mm. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, uh, hi, I'm uh, Jimmy. So, and I wonder, like, uh, the central um, no adrenergic neuron, like, from locus cellulis, could it be contribute to those uh, adrenergic receptor activation, and uh, could it be the, the expression could it be changed by the ischemic condition? I don't know does a no adrenergic receptor express in the in the brain does. A, and smooth muscle cell or not. Yeah. Yes, it is. I, uh, we purified the smooth muscle cell from the brain and uh, did the bulk on a sequence. Uh, surprisingly, actually smooth muscle cell expressed many types and at different levels of neurotransmitter receptor, neuropeptide receptor and neuromodulator receptor. Yes, it is. Okay, uh, is there any more questions? Okay, so more, no more questions. Uh, thanks, Jimmy, for a beautiful talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, Aaron, so start for Tim Jones talk. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. And um, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ching Jong Kong. He's a associate professor of pathology and neurology at 
Case Western Reserve University. He's the Associate Director of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. Um, he did his undergraduate and master's degree in Southern China in Nanjing University. And then he came uh, to UMass to do a PhD and then did a postdoc at, at Yale. And um, his laboratory has many interests all centered around prion diseases. He studies how um, animal prions can be transmitted to humans. He studies uh, this very provocative finding that there are infectious prions in the skin of, uh, of uh, prion disease patients, uh, uh, CJD patients, and he tries to figure out what causes sporadic uh, CJD. And um, I think what he'll talk about today is a discovery about um, a particular modification, a cleavage of uh, the cellular PRP protein. Uh, thanks, Ching Chong. All right, thank you. Um, let me see. Come on, video. All right, can you guys see it? Looks good. Great. Uh, thank you everyone for the, for the great introduction and uh, for the invitation to give the talk. Um, and first of all, Anna, it's, uh, it's great to be uh, joining this group. It's the first time for me to join. And uh, um, I, 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 uh, we can talk about our study on the arva cleavage of cellular prime protein, uh, which is uh, uh, an important subject in the, in the, um, in the prion field and also in the NADD involving prime protein. The cellular prime protein is a, a universal expressed protein, actually, although it's heavily expressed in the, in the cellular nervous system, in the muscles, and uh, lymph node tissues. It's also expressed heavily um, in the germ cells um, and developing embryos. It has a lot of functions. It's a small protein, but it has a lot of functions, although some have become disputed because it uh, depends on what model you use. But generally speaking, it's believed that uh, it does have uh, play a role in uh, uh, neuronal survival, in uh, um, uh, protection against stress uh, and maintaining peripheral mining uh, in peripheral nerve, nerve axons, and also in uh, differentiation and the perturbation of some cell types. Um, one good thing about this is that uh, uh, parent protein is not essential. So we, there have been a lot of studies on the uh, mice or cattle that are devoid of parent protein. It appears larger than normal, although you've studied carefully, there's some subtle difference, but it's not a, a big issue. Uh, prion protein is known for its role in prion disease. It's required for both replication and apologetics of prion disease. Um, I'm not going to go into detail with the prion disease today. I'll put more on the, the, the prion protein itself. What less known is about prion protein is that it also serves as a key common receptor for uh, a set of uh, a number of toxic oligomers like uh, A-beta, uh, tau, and aronacyphenine, which are important in pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. Uh, new body dementia and a final temporal dementia, among a couple other uh, seeming autopsies and uh, autopsies. And the processing of protein is important uh, in many aspects, and there are several types of them. Here is a, a summary of the uh, uh, cleavages uh, normally occur to the protein. The antimonal part, near antimonal part, is it's called beta cleavage, which they believe most is done conducted uh, through the reactive oxygen species. And this cleavage seem to have some protective role against the red oxygen species itself, although the products of the of beta cleavage uh, appear to be relatively neutral. And in the cetamine end, there is called a shedding, which is, can be done either at the end of the peptide, mostly done by the atom, atom 10 protein, and can also be done by uh, phospholipase uh, at the GPI anchor to, uh, to the cetamine end of the peptide. Um, the other cleavage, on the other hand, is probably the most uh, beneficial because it cuts right kind of in the middle of the so central domain. Uh, and uh, this cut leads to the so-called antimonal peptide and the septimonal, uh, septimonal uh, fragments. And I can show you why it's, it's good. Because this cleavage first destroy the, the phonons, the cellular prime protein. And then this part of it can no longer serve, the fragments can no longer serve as substrate for prime So it depletes the su substrate pool. Secondly, uh, the, the decreased KRBC at cell surface level also reduces the receptor, which is the key receptor for uh, oligomer, toxic oligomers of the beta, tau, and uh, and also for prions. 
in addition, the product itself, uh, the uh, the antimalarial peptide N1 itself is a neuroprotective, as not a neuroprotective, it's protective as most cell types in many cell types, and it can also directly neutralize the toxic oligomers. The cytomino peptide C1 can has been shown to be inhibiting proliferation, although it has also been reported to have some pro apoptotic, apoptotic activities. Uh, but in transgenic mice expressing C1, it might appear to be normal, so it's not a probably not a big issue. Um, so today, uh, okay, before I go here, so what does what enzyme does our cleavage? Uh, earlier studies, primarily using uh, cell lines, suggested that Adam 10 and Adam 17 are involved. Uh, but however, uh, later studies using uh, primary cells and uh, transgenic mice showing that if you change the, the protein level either by overcrossing or knock them out totally, you don't see much impact. So it seems that right now, this, protein, this two part probably not involved, or this uh, somehow is kind of murky, what, what the exact role are in our cleavage. Basically, at this point, we don't know what enzyme does our cleavage, which is a, a very bad for the field. So today I'm trying to convince you that the ADAMA is the uh, A major advocate enzyme for PRPC. So this kind of this part just like my life is kind of coincidence. At that time, we developed a, a, a transgenic line called TGHUK, which is a, a, a doxycycline inducible muscle specific transgenic line. So you can see if we give doxycycline to the mice, over time, the mice develop, develop a lot of PRP. There's a two bands, one phone and one the cell fragment in the muscle. And besides the total level of total protein, you also see the cell fragment ratio relative to fullness also increase. So this is quantified on this side, you see that actually the cell fullness ratio, which is served as a, a surrogate for the uh, PRV advocacy activity, you can see also increase with time. So we set out to identify which, what's causing the increase in the in cellular muscle here. So we did a micro analysis, uh, look at all the proteins, including all the uh, relatively uh, potentially uh, relevant uh, atom enzymes. We found that all these atoms were checked on atom A, rising or a level of uh, mRNA level rising with um, the PRP or, or the RK activity. Then with the plot of the adamant protein shows actually the adamant protein level also go, goes up with time. So this suggests that LMA uh, are likely uh, RK enzyme. To confirm that, we did a first did a experiment where we used the, the mouse cell to tell marble cell line. We knocked down the uh, LMA uh, gene expression and so a, a, a number of independent clones that have different LMA level. And then we correlated the, the LMA level with the, their uh, RK activity in, the, in, the, in that particular uh, song, uh, clones. We found that there's a pr almost perfect linear positive correlation between the LMA level and the uh, uh, PRP RK activity. So this is in cell line. Next, we try to do, do it in vivo. We, we developed a set of chain mice express a different level of, of the human prion protein. And coincidentally, or maybe actually not coincidentally, uh, you can see that in those mice, they also have uh, different um, RK activity. And the RK activity is correlated with uh, different LMA level. And if you do linear correlating analysis, actually they are almost linearly correlated as well. So finally, we, uh, we want to see whether uh, if you knock out LMA totally in the mice, what happens? You can see here, if you knock out adamant totally in the adamant knockout mice muscles, you see a more than 80% drop in the RK activity in the skeletal muscle. So the last piece that I want to show that RMA protein can actually cut the PRP protein in vitro. So we, we, uh, we digest the RMA uh, recumbent human PRP with RMA recumbent RMA protein in test tubes. We isolate the, the fragments of the cut and then we did a mass back analysis we detected the uh, C1 and A1 fragments. So this shows that the protein LMA can do the RK cleavage. So all this combined, we believe, we show that LMA is the primary RK enzyme for the cellular prion protein in the skeletal muscles and also in the skeletal muscle tissues. However, our main interest in our lab is mostly on the, uh, on the brain and the nervous system. So we we'll ask the question whether LMA plays a similar role in our cleavage or PRP in the brain tissue and in neurons. So to answer this question, uh, we first overexpressed uh, ADMA uh, using a uh, plasma encoding the full lens ADMA uh, protein and uh, in the human neuron plasma cell line M17. They can see the overexpressing 
LMA lead to a, a fourfold increase in our activity in the neuronal cell line. Then we look at the impact of uh, knocking out LMA in the primary neurons uh, derived from the LMA knockout mice and compared with that from water mice. And in this case, in the primary neurons of LMA knockout mice, we saw an over 60% drop in the RRK activity compared with water neurons. Finally, we look at the, uh, the RRK activity uh, in the brain of the uh, LMA knockout mice in comparison with our water mice. In this case, we saw about 30% drop less than what we saw in primary neurons. Uh, on, on top of that, we also saw uh, in a tragedy mice called fia 20 h the overcrest uh, uh, PRP, but uh, more importantly, they have higher level of LMA. And in this case, we also see higher advocacy activity. So together, this evidence think, uh, think, uh, suggests strongly that the LMA is also a major advocacy enzyme for PRP in the brain and the neurons. Although this uh, on the brain side and the neural side, we still need to do more. Uh, we're trying to do, um, manipulate the uh, atomic activity in primary neuron atoms might to see whether it also uh, cre uh, correlates uh, what we found so far. And we can have to do same same experiment in vivo by injecting a plasmid or recombinant AV vector that express atoma in the brain, then see whether locally we do that and on a transient basis, whether it also achieve, achieve some effect. Uh, that's something that's still ongoing. So uh, what about the, the, the ADAM-10 and ADAM-17? Although I did show before that uh, they're conflicting data. Uh, here is a recent study, uh, well, not too recent, but uh, about eight or nine years ago, um, at a lab in uh, UC uh, Santa Cruz, they did a, a recombinant protein study, pure recombinant protein, is recombinant ADAMs and uh, recombinant PRP, and look at the impact uh, of the cleavage sites and also impact of the different ions. And you found that uh, ADAM A, in our conditions, they do con con conduct our activity as we found uh, uh, in our lab. They also said that they found that they can find activity also in another site called our two, which is a little bit downstream for acetamine. Besides, they also can conduct our cleavage, a better case, sorry, uh, and near the more polluted antimony, which is uh, uh, a new of, at that time. On the other hand, uh, Adam 17 can also cleave something called our three, which is even further down than our two towards the system land. Adam 10 can do the same thing. And Adam can also cleave I mean, at the shading site, uh, which has been reported earlier by other labs. So uh, unfortunately, this uh, this kind of unusual cleavage site by the Adam 10, Adam 17, also the beta cleavage site for the Adam A has not been report, confirmed or reported uh, in either cells or, or, or in tissues, so purely common protein. So that's still kind of a bit up in there, whether it's true. But anyway, in, uh, in summary, I think uh, combining with our work with uh, other people's work, it seems that the pedal cleavage, maybe we can add the Adam A to potentially is uh, involving a pedal cleavage there. And then for the arrow cleavage, so far still Adam A primarily, but Adam 10, 17 might be doing some something uh, uh, at, at a non-conditional, non-kind of typical site if we can confirm the uh, in cell tissues. So uh, from what I just told you, did, uh, the pure protein seems to be a very good target for developing therapeutics or even uh, prophylactics against pure disease, maybe a couple other, uh, as many as other uh, related disease. So here is a kind of a number of strategy we are thinking about that can be employed. One way to do it is to enhance uh, so called, uh, our secretive, basically the RK enzyme, uh, our secretive activity. You can do it by infusing recombinant uh, at our secret, we talk about in recombinant LMA or you can enhance activated endogenous atom expression in the brain, or you can just uh, express atom A uh, from a, a gene separate vector. And that, that's, that's the, this kind of approach where, uh, where I mean, if you enhance our conductivity, you're gonna supposedly, you're gonna supposed to uh, uh, um, drop the cellular PRP level for one. That in itself, itself is beneficial a lot. And second is that you can produce N1 that will be beneficial. So the second approach, uh, the second strategy is to enhance N1 level directly, not through enhancing our cage activity. Instead, you can direct provide recombinant N1, or you can express a security form N1 directly from an inside vector. Um, the similar strategy can be applied to the shedding, because the shedding also reduces cells the PRP level. And the shedding will also produce the, the shaded the full-time PRP to a space. And the shaded 
for an MPRB will have similar like the, like the, like the uh, N1 peptide, can also sequester, neutralize the toxic oligomers. Uh, so similar which can be used to enhance the uh, shape shape level. The last approach is a little bit uh, more recent, is that uh, you can use exosomes. The exosome and rhythm and play a lot of roles, not only in pathology, but also can be bio have biological and therapeutic function. In this case, we can think about, we can make a, 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 a exosomes in vitro uh, that has high level of PRP on the surface. In this case, this, this kind of exosomal PRP, they are full lens, they have GP anchor, but they can, they can still bind toxic molecular oligomer, but can no longer signal the toxic stuff to, to the cells. They can sequester toxic molecule outside the cells. That's how it works. Um, so that's the overall strategy. But at this point in my lab, we have been uh, trying to adopt this uh, uh, three-prone approach. One is we're trying to overcrest uh, the secreted form of antipeptide PRP from uh, gene cell factor. The second, we want to increase, enhance the PRP advocacy activity, such as just reversing LMA from a uh, gene cell factor. And finally, we want to knock down the PRP expression using SRT and SRNA. So this three approach can be done simultaneously, carry on different vectors, but in just same time. So hopefully we'll achieve a, a, a synergistic effect. So uh, at this point, we already showed, I showed you earlier, we already have few LMA expression can not, can enhance our activity. Here, we developed the two uh, sRNA targeting human PRP mRNA. We showed that uh, in this case, if, if you uh, use this two sRNA, you can knock down the PRP expression by, um, over 90% in the, in the uh, neurobiological cell line M17. But uh, for the, the strategy of expressing uh, the security N1 had, had, some, had some headaches. We spent almost two years trying to express it in uh, the mouse cell line, in the human cell line, but it just cannot get to see anything. But this is recombinant N1 as a control. We don't see anything at all. We later figured out that actually this, uh, uh, this N1 directly as N1 peptide is stuck inside the cell. So it does not go out. So you cannot express it that way. So now we are, we express now our modified the design to express something for A1 plus, and now we were able to successfully uh, express it both in the cell body and also in the uh, in the security in the medium. So uh, we're now develop, well, we're now kind of making this uh, recombinant vector that can produce all this uh, NMA or A1 or uh, or the uh, sRNAs, and they're going to test them in our pre model and then ultimately go other models. Hopefully, it will work. And finally, I want to. Um, Thank uh, my people in my lab who are contributed a lot. This is this project has been lasting uh, quite a few years. Uh, different people that did it, and my collaborators, uh, Dr. Barsh, uh, um, provided the edema plasmid, and uh, Dr. Wito Shuri provided the common N1, and the, uh, the other two, Jenna, uh, Jen, uh, this uh, Sergey and uh, Jenna, they helped with mass spec analysis, and uh, Dr. Stephanie Booth lab helped with the uh, microanalysis, and uh, Dr. Carl Blobo uh, provided the edema nucleomice. Uh, the thing about funding agency, NIH, and uh, CDG Foundation. And I thank you for your attention. I'd like to welcome the questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ching Chong. Um, great talk. We have time for questions. Ching Chong, so I have a quick question for the uh, ADEM 10 over expression strategy. So, uh, so is there any other subtract in the brand, right? So, one well, well, friend of mine working on Adam Ten. I, I don't yeah. know about uh, Adam A, but I'm sure there's some um, some other uh, substrate on the neuron. So, would, would you consider consider about that? Yes, that's that's a, a question I did I, I did not discuss because it's complicated. There, uh, huh? all atoms have a lot of substrates. Adam Ten, even Adam Seventeen, all of them has many many substrates. So that's the this is the downside of using the um, uh, overpassing atom strategy. It's always concerned. Not only have model substrates, but also almost all atoms we're talking about atom eight, ten, seventeen. They are also uh, if you express it, we know that can promote cancer. Quite a few cancers are uh, promoted by by high level of those atoms. So this is a uh, uh, one of the things we need to worry about. What I think. Uh, uh, at this point, we're just trying to see whether overcrossing Adam A in that case, uh, whether it can help treat the disease uh, without worrying about the, their uh, side effects. But a long term, uh, I think the more viable strategy probably is to to activate a locally uh, endogenous Adam A gene expression, um, probably through some kind of small molecule that can activate uh, the endogenous genes so they were only active when they need it. 
hopefully will reduce the risk on the uh, cancer. Um, yeah, so, so that's one reason we are focusing actually more on the uh, expressing overexpressing N1 because N1 puff that does not seem to have any any problems. All good, nothing bad. Maybe some bad come out later, but we don't see anything bad yet. And then knocking out, uh, knocking down PRB protein is also a very straightforward <laughs> strategy. It has been a few have had quite a few paper published that uh, if you knock down protein uh, in the brain by either transgenic technology or using the viral vectors, the animals seem to be doing perfectly well. And they do suppress prions or adamidities if you're doing that. So that's where uh, we are probably more focusing or on the knocking down PRP together with we're overseeing uh, the secreted N1 as our primary strategy. Adam is added uh, on top. We'll see whether they need that or, uh, or not. Sure, sure. Good question. Okay, other questions? Yeah, I don't want to emphasize that uh, the, our strategy, because the PRP is a common factor in many disease, we are hoping that uh, the same strategy can be used to treat all of these together. Um, uh, it's one strategy for multiple disease. That's, uh, that's my hope. Mm -hmm. What's the latest on the role of PRP as a receptor for A beta? Well, uh, right now, uh, the, this, there was some controversy after the first paper publishing showing that uh, the PRP is a receptor. There are a couple of groups, two or three, uh, they seem to provide some of contradicting data. But however, uh, then after that paper was published, uh, all the following papers are supporting the original report that uh, PRP play a role. So I'm not totally sure what's the exact issues, why some people, groups uh, had an opposite results. I guess one possibility is uh, that uh, the model is different. Uh, the mouse model is maybe different. Um, okay. And also the, um, you know, um, the exact approach they use are somewhat different. And the toxicity tools they use to, to test their uh, uh, toxicity could obviously be a could obviously issue. You guys know very well that uh, it's very for example, it is the ABR preparation, for example, if you high prepare it, <laughs> high use it, could have big impact on, on, on the result you got. So uh, I'm not totally sure, but there are a couple of possibilities. Okay. Um, Andrew Steele has a question. He's a prion expert. Oh, any here? Oh. Uh, you muted it. Uh, do you maybe you need? Hello, yeah, so I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Um. So a prediction of, of this model of PRP and uh, kind of binding up toxic aggregates, I always thought would be obvious, but if you, if you overexpress PRP, it should help cure these neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and if you delete PRP, it should make them worse. Would you agree with that or? Uh, no, overexpress PRP we know has been a few, quite a few uh, animal studies, including our animal model has shown that if you overexpress PRP, the mice have some problem already. Uh, it's somewhat toxic. Um, the exact mechanisms uh, in our case, in our mouse, in our mouse, uh, uh, in this model for the muscle compression of PRP, we know that uh, it, 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 it can activate some PP3 dependent pathway that cause uh, death of the uh, muscle cells. But the, uh, other people have shown that uh, it's definitely cause, um, um, sometimes causing brain disease, not just, uh, not just the peripheral disease, if you require PRP. Uh, because I said, the knockout PRP has a limited impact on animals. Uh, and knockout down PRP has been done many times in, in animal mouse models, did not show uh, uh, significant side effects. Um, so knocking down on PRP probably is safer. It's not essential, for sure. And has limited side effects if you knock them down. Overproduction has a lot of side effects, but PRP has a lot of activities. So it's hard to predict what's going to happen if we produce too much PRP. It just has so many impact on so many different interpretive partners. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Uh, great talk, Ching Zhong, and uh, thanks, Jiamin. Awesome.
talk. Uh, remember, everyone, next week we'll take one week off, um, and then we'll be back on July 11th, 12th. Uh, please keep letting us know if you want to present your work here. Lots of slots available towards the end of the summer and the fall. See everyone soon. Thank you. 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 Thank you